Hello, and welcome to the second half of our Great Depression discussion. Uh, <clears throat> in class, we talked about kind of the first New Deal. Uh, we looked at FDR being elected and his goals for Reconstruction, which were the three R's, Relief, Recovery, Reform. Um, and we talked about a lot of the programs uh, of his first New Deal programs, and a lot of those put people to work. Things like the PWA uh, that put... Um, hundreds of thousands of men to work. Talk about the CCC, um, again, putting men to work, single unmarried men uh, to work. We talked about the FDIC, which reformed banking uh, and made it safe for people to put money in banks again so that banks can continue to loan money to uh, individuals and restart our economy. Um, we looked at the TVA, which also uh, put people to work more in the Tennessee Valley region, uh, which was the poorest in the area. The NRA, National Recovery Administration, even though it was found to be unconstitutional. Um, AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which also was found to be unconstitutional, which kind of helped out farmers. Um, with the success of, of the, the first New Deal in the first couple hundred days, or hundred days specifically, and then later on, um, FDR with his popularity and his support of Congress decides to uh, follow that up with what is known as the second New Deal. And the second New Deal is going to be a lot of the same. Um, only going to be maybe a little bit more aggressive uh, with those. But remember the few, the two acts that we had that were unconstitutional. That's going to come up later on when we look at um, maybe his disagreements with the Supreme Court and why he disagreed with the Supreme Court. So let's talk about the second New Deal. Um, one of the first big programs that was passed in the second New Deal, <coughs> um, I guess we kind of go back. 1934 was midterm elections. And this was anytime you have a midterm election, you decide whether or not the American public is agreeing with what your um, with what your administration has done. So if if the Democrats win big in the midterms, that means that the American public like what's going on with the Democrats and with uh, what FDR is doing. And the midterm elections were, uh, again, big victories for the Democrats. And so you're going to see that as a mandate for FDR to continue on his New Deal programs. And so by the summer of 1935, uh, which is six months into the new term of Congress, uh, he passes the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. And this is specifically an infrastructure bill. Again, a lot of, like the PWA, the, the Public Works Administration, this is the Works Progress. And this is mainly infrastructure. Um, Let's put people to work and fix our infrastructure at the same time. Um, but we had a bunch of crumbling br bridges. We needed new roads built. We needed new schools, hospitals, all that. And that's what the WPA is going to be for. Very similar to the PWA and the CWA, that it's going to provide jobs. This time, it's it's a, a much larger uh, and much broader program. This is going to spend billions of dollars between 1935 and 1940. And... It, at its peak has about 3.4 million Americans, mainly men, a uh, few women in there, but mainly men working. Um, most are gonna do construction jobs. Most are gonna do, uh, you know, build things like roads and bridges and, 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 uh, and, and airports um, because of, of the new air travel that we have going on. Um, but in, in total, I mean, we have over 4,000 new schools built, 130 new hospitals built, 9,000 miles of storm drains and sewer lines, again, all infrastructure, 29,000 new bridges or fixed bridges, 150 new airfields. Um, we repaired 280,000 miles of roads and planted 24 million trees. So you, as you can see, this is a massive undertaking um, and very successful. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have its opponents. Uh, obviously, this is a, a, a complete change from 1920s where it was hands off government. This is government essentially providing a bunch of jobs and becoming much stronger and much more involved. <coughs> and not everyone's going to like that. Um, part of one of the other programs with the WPA is going to be the Arts Project. Uh, so it's not just um, it's not just infrastructure when they build schools, when they build city halls and when they build um, you know different city buildings uh, they employ a bunch of 
obviously unemployed artists. Uh, artists during the 1930s saw the problem just like everybody else. Nobody's spending their money on art. Uh, and so this is a way for the federal government to help out some of those art projects. And we actually have the federal arts project that is uh, is is put out. Um, this is going to employ artists, actors, writers in a variety of job opportunities. Uh, musicians and actors stage performances that were free to the public. And so they put on plays, they put on concerts uh, that were paid for by the federal government program, the arts project, um, but but American public could go to. Since no one's you know spending some of that discretionary income on concerts uh, or or going to plays, uh, they're able to do that. If you look at these two pictures on this screen, the one on the right-hand side over here, that's actually the Sioux Falls City Hall. This is a, the Sioux Falls City Hall was redone. That was a WPA project. Um, and the they also employed artists uh, to to create this mural of, of, uh, of art in that. Uh, this is another arts project. Um, I'm going to share a website with you that you can look at any city in any state and look at all the WPA or look at all the New Deal projects that were done. And a lot of those are going to be art projects. Um, if you go to most small towns, you see murals on the, the side of walls uh, that represent the city or represent the area or represent the history of a city. Uh, I know my hometown in Lenox had had one for years on the side of their uh, Legion, the American Legion building. And that uh, I don't think that was specifically a WPA project, but it was it was similar to that. That was later on. That I think that was in the 1950s or 60s that, that was done. <clears throat> but it's not just people that can do construction. They want they want uh, a well-rounded populace, and so they uh, encourage artists to also be part of this project. Uh, and so that was the federal arts project. There's a good video on the WPA. We're not going to watch it obviously in class, but uh, again, you have access to this, so you can watch uh, and you can see the the all the projects that were done by the WPA. Another issue, obviously, is going to be labor. Um, and the NLRA, which is also known as the Wagner Act, is going to replace the National Industrial Recovery Act, which was found to be unconstitutional. And the Wagner Act guaranteed the right to organize and join unions. It, like we saw in the 1920s with open shops, this is they want to guarantee people the right to join unions. The problem that happened is that most people's wages were cut. And essentially, the, the businesses were like, well, either take a, a cut in pay or, or have no pay. And uh, a lot of people don't think that that was unfair, especially um, uh, Roosevelt and the Democrats. And so they uh, not only they they allowed people the right to work or guaranteed people the right to work and join unions, uh, and collectively bargain, but they also identified business practices that may be deemed to be unfair to labor, um, and they create the National Labor Relations Board to protect those rights. And, uh, and so this is kind of an extension, worried again that it was going to be un unconstitutional. Uh, and so we're going to look at what Roosevelt does later on to, to see if that fixes. The longest lasting impact of the New Deal is going to be the Social Security Act. If you look at your paycheck, if you're one of those people that has a job and you look at your paycheck, every single paycheck, you get money taken out for Social Security. Uh, and this is a pension program. And if you look at what pension is, it's retirement. Uh, so when you retire, you should get some of that money back in the form of monthly payments to encourage you to not work um, you know, past a certain year. Uh, I think right now it's 65, four or five that you can start collecting Social Security. Um, but this is a, 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 an, a retirement program um, that should allow you to retire and still get money paid for <coughs> through Social Security, which essentially is a tax. I don't know if it's technically a tax, but it, it's basically a tax. Um, and so when you get money taken out of your paycheck every month, that is invested. And then when you retire, that should, should go to you. Well, originally, obviously, there's no money in the pool. And so you are paying people to retire by taxes that are going out of current worker salaries. Um, and eventually that is going to create a big enough pool that you are also taking out your own money. Uh, you're taking out your own money and help being paid for by that. Now, if you look at, if you've been paying attention to politics in the last 20 years, we know that social security is starting to run dry. 
people are living longer. Um, baby boom really hurt that because uh, now a lot of the baby boomers, which we'll talk about later, it, they're the reaching retirement agents. They're starting to really drain that Social Security. And so who knows how long it's going to be uh, around, whether you're going to see it or whether I'm even going to see it. And so Social Security, um, what they did is they encouraged people to retire, encouraged people that were 60, 62, 65 to retire. That opened up a position for a younger person, um, a younger uh, man, woman, uh, mainly men, to uh, retire. And so for those that retire, you get their job uh, or you get a job. And so that's just encouraging more employment uh, by paying people off in taxes. And this is something that obviously not a lot of people really uh, completely agreed with. Um, could be unconstitutional because you're taking tax money of people that are, are working right now and paying people to essentially retire. Uh, and so that Social Security um, doesn't need to be reformed. Absolutely. So the election of 18 or 1936, uh, FDR is very popular still, and it's it's just as much of a butt kicking, if if not a bigger butt kicking than it was before. Uh, Republicans nominate Alf Landon, um, who was governor of Kansas. He criticizes the uh, the the New Deal spending as too much government overreach and too much uh, overspending and deficit spending by the federal government. Um, and F FDR basically swept every state but Maine and Vermont, um, over 60% of the popular vote, um, huge support from workers and farmers because that's, you know, those are people that he helped. And so the election of 1936 became, again, another mandate for uh, President Roosevelt to kind of do his thing. Not everybody agreed with him, though. Um, there were there were people all over the place that didn't necessarily agree with him. Um, liberals who that's what FDR was, they thought that he wasn't doing enough and that a lot of his uh, New Deal spending was too much. Um, those that were more on the far left in the socialist movement uh, criticized providing too much assistance for businesses and too little for unemployed minorities, women and elderly. Um, and so that's that was an issue. Conservatives, uh, again, more Republicans thought that this was too much power by the federal government and they didn't like the idea of deficit spending. Um, and the Second New Deal really had a very pro-union stance. And that's not um, obviously if we look at the 1920s, that's not really what they were for. And then you also see a bunch of demagogues. Um, there are three specific demagogues that we'll talk about. Number one is Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin, uh, Charles E. Coughlin was a Catholic priest who had a, a weekly radio show. Um, that had, I believe it was more than a million people turn in to his weekly radio show. Um, and he uh, attacked the uh, unions. He attacked the um, New Deal. Uh, however, he became very anti-Semitic, uh, blamed Jews for a bunch of issues that the Americans were going through, not unlike what Hitler's doing at the, right around the same time. Um, and uh, became very fascist. And, and if we look at kind of, well, when we look at the rise of Hitler in uh, the 1930s, 33, 34, 35, this is around the same time <clears throat> as he becomes very popular. Um, he tries that here. Uh, and so people start, started kind of going away once he became more of that anti-Semite and, and fascist. Anti-Semite just simply means anti-Jewish. Um, and so people started kind of tuning away from his radio program. Um, Catholic Church stopped uh, broadcasting it uh, and all that. Second person is Dr. Francis, Francis Townsend. Um, and he became very popular before the passage of the Social Security Act. He, uh, he kind of came up with the idea of Social Security, only more of a, um, more of a, a radical plan. He proposed that every retired person over 60 would get $200 a month and payments would come from 2% federal sales tax. Um, he said that they, this would increase consumer spending and stimulate the economy. Um, and, and again, this is really the basis for the Social Security Act. Uh, and so he can, you can see some of that. So uh, in the Social Security Act. And so he, his popularity kind of forced the federal government to do something about it. And then finally, you have Huey Long, uh, who is nicknamed Kingfish. He was a senator of Louisiana, and this is his picture on the right-hand side. <clears throat> he starts this Share the Wealth program, and he said that every American should have a minimum income 
of $5,000 every year and that there should be a maximum income. Nobody should have more than 50 million. So again, this anti big business um, program. So minimum 5,000, then hundred percent tax, anything above 50 million. Um, obviously kind of a, a, a take from the rich, give to the poor uh, idea. And anything people made above 50 million, nobody, he, he claimed that nobody needs more than 50 million and that anything above 50 million is taxed 100%. Um, and so most of the payments for this share your wealth program are going to come from taxes on the wealthy. Now, if we look at recently, there have been people that have mentioned this. Uh, we've had a couple former presidential candidates mention this um, about having a um, basic income, um, basic income for everybody. I think recently it was like, 12,000 a year, everybody should get a thousand dollar a month payment and 12,000 a year besides your, your paychecks and whatnot. And that would help the economy. So this is, this has been around for a long time. Uh, Hugh Long even challenged FDR in the 1936, or he was going to be a challenger for the democratic nominee in 1936. He became quite popular. However, his candidacy ended when he was uh, killed by an assassin in 1935. So, um, maybe a little bit more radical and people didn't love the idea of taxing the rich. So who knows? I'm sure there's conspiracy theories behind his assassination, whether it's FDR, whether it's big business, whatever it may be. So we get to the court packing. So as you know, there are three branches of government. We have the legislative branch, which is Congress. We have the, the executive branch, which is, is the president. And then you have the judicial branch, the legislative branch. You are elected every two years or every six years. Senators are six years. Representatives are two years. So the people decide in in the legislative branch whether or not they want to keep their legislators around rep, uh, representatives every two years, senators every six years. The executive branch is reelected every four years. The president is reelected every four years. Once again, a chance for the public uh, based on you know the needs of the time that they uh, can decide whether or not they agree or disagree with the president by voting him or her in or not. The judicial branch, th those are lifetime appointments. So the Supreme Court is lifetime opponents. And if you remember, we have, we've had mainly Republican presidents basically since Lincoln. Uh, and so most of the courts, I believe it was either 7-2 or 6-3 at the time, um, were, uh, I think it was, it was actually 7-2 conservative or Republican nominated Supreme Court justices. So we have a very democratic Congress, a Democrat president, and a primarily, overwhelmingly Republican court. Uh, and as you saw, the court didn't agree with some of what FDR was doing. And so his plan is to pack the court. His plan is to add six more justices to the bench to make their 15, to make it be 15. There is nine right now to make it be 15. And he obviously would then nominate those six and it would be eight, seven, um, liberal. Uh, and so that was his idea is that times have changed and the, the Supreme court has not. Uh, and so he's trying to dilute the power of those sitting justices that are kind of against him. Um, and he essentially put in a bunch of yes, men, uh, people that would, would vote for his policies. That way he could continue doing these new deal programs and there would be no, uh, no resistance from the courts. <clears throat> uh, Congress completely disagreed and Congress who up until now essentially had been a bunch of yes men um, and Congress said no and they did not they did not accept his his plan uh, and this actually hurt some of his popularity um, he is going to be reelected two more times but it still hurts his popularity as you, you'll see in the 1940 election um, but his whole goal was to increase the, the, the size of the Supreme Court justice. Now, again, if you've been paying attention in the last five years, the same concept has happened. Um, after McConnell didn't allow Obama to, to uh, choose a replacement for Scalia, um, and then later on, after McConnell, in the same situation, allowed Trump, uh, President Trump to appoint somebody in replacement of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we saw this in the last five years. And there's been talk about court packing. Uh, again, this is not something new, but it's it's ultimately been something that's been unpopular or unpopular enough that it hasn't really achieved any uh, any 
traction at all. There's nothing in the Constitution that says there has to be nine Supreme Court justices. Um, we've actually added Supreme Court justices, but this, the amount of Supreme Court justices has stayed the same, I'd like to say, since the 18, I don't even know, 1830s or 1840s. So we've had nine for a long time. Um, but he wanted to change that. When we look at unions, um, obviously the Wagner Act and, and the National Recovery Act had originally tried to create these, these more pro-union stances. Um, the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organization, they tried to organize unskilled workers. Um, the AFL, which we'd already talked about, the American Federation of Labor, um, was kind of part of that, but they also, the new CIO wanted to, uh, to expand, to include more than just skilled white and males. They wanted to include uh, pretty much everybody. Uh, and they focused specifically on unskilled workers in automotive, steel, and textile industries. Um, we also had the Fair Labor Standard Act in 1938, which is passed. That's the last major reform of the New Deal. Uh, and that put regulations on business labor practices, uh, but only for interstate commerce. There were a couple strikes. Um, GM had a strike. They had a sit-down strike where they essentially went to work but didn't work. Uh, President and gover governor uh, turned down the company's request for troops to, to essentially force them to work. Uh, again, kind of a change since the last half of the, the 19th century that we had. There was also a steel strike that happened at the same time um, where it became more violent and four people ended up being dead, becoming dead. Uh, and again, as I talked about already, the Fair Labor Standards Act. In 1937 and 38, there was a recession which kind of uh, cost the, caused the New Deal to lose some of that momentum. Um, and because of the uh, recession, because of the taxes on Social Security, spending kind of went down. Um, that had gone up. Uh, as you can see by the graph over here, we had about 12% annual growth at the beginning of this. And then when the Social Security Act was passed, we, we had kind of uh, stagnant growth. Um, and the idea of Keynesian economics um, is, and this is by John Maynard Keynes. So if you take economics, you'll, you'll hear about or you'll understand Keynesian economics. The idea is that deficits, you deficit spend to initiate economic growth. So you you put money back into the people and they put money back into the government uh, through taxes. They spend and, and taxes go back in. So the, the idea is this. Now, this probably isn't the greatest, but uh, the idea is that you power yourself. Um, and it ha it, it's had, you know, there are opponents and there are, are proponents of all of these uh, different groups. So you, we do see that kind of lose momentum. Uh, gains back up a little bit after 38. Um, in 1939, but really is not going to uh, see the, the growth that we had before. So what's life for different groups? Obviously, women, anytime women had a job, they were accused of taking jobs from men that could provide for their families. And most of the New Deal programs just ignored women. Uh, farmers, we already talked about the Dust Bowl that was going on. Uh, the, the drought just killed farmers. Um, a bunch of Okies moved, o Oklahomans who lost jobs moved west to California. Uh, to farm and work in factories there. Um, if you look at probably the most famous, the migrant mother picture, um, that's uh, of a bunch of Okies or Oklahomans moving to California to find jobs. Uh, African-American rates obviously had higher unemployment rates than their white counterparts. And most of the relief programs excluded them just like women. Native Americans, however, did start to see some uh, some increases. We had the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which is also known as the Indian New Deal, uh, which repealed the Dawes Act. So, yay, we finally repealed the Dawes Act. It returned a lot of that land uh, or control of land to the tribes. Um, they also had CCC projects that focus on reservations and giving Indians jobs. And so uh, we did see some improvements for uh, American Indians. Um, the creation of the BIA or the improvement of the BIA where they actually, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, where they hired uh, actual Indians rather than a bunch of white people to take advantage, take control of that. <coughs> so that's the, uh, that's the New Deal. And uh, again, I highly recommend you watch Heimler. He has something for both 7.9 and 7.10. Um, highly recommend you watch him. 
But this is the end of the New Deal. This is the end of the Great Depression. Uh, we'll see, as you can see, it's had some successes. We, we put millions of people to work and did stimulate the economy. We dropped our unemployment rate from 25 to about 13%, which is still high, still very high. Um, but it, it, it is obviously much better than the 25% that we had. Um, but there are still a lot of Americans that are out of work. There's still a lot of Americans that are struggling day to day, homeless um, and, and all that. And